Don't you see what a mistake it would be to throw it away? Well, good morning, all of our campuses, all of you watching online, all of us here at Frisco East. Uh, before I dive into our last message in the series, Christmas at the Movies, remind you, Christmas Eve, uh, this Thursday and Friday at Frisco East, and then all day Friday at our, all of our campuses. And, and we have some invite cards at the Info Center, just in case you're having a conversation with a coworker, maybe at lunch you mention it, and they're saying, hey, tell me more about that. You can, you can give them an information card. They can, res- they can reserve their seat, or they don't have to if they're guests. We ask you to reserve so that we just know in our services how much room we have for our guests and just make sure we're better prepared. But uh, along with that, on Christmas Eve, we're collecting socks for the homeless in the Dallas area. So an easy way to to get that knocked out is, is you go on our website where you RSVP for Christmas, and on that page, there is a place where you can buy socks. You can go to, it t- takes you to, to where you can buy socks and then you send the, the, the socks to the church and then we distribute it like that. Or you can bring them here at one of our campuses and we have bins all through the campus. So I hope you'll, you'll join me on Christmas Eve. I, I, I think it's going to be a great, great service, old fashioned, uh, nothing crazy, nothing to embarrass you. I promise just a, a good, good, uh, uh, a service for, for songs and for the message. So invite some friends, would you? Um, today, Christmas at the Movies, over the last few weeks, we have taken icon, an iconic movie and we've grabbed a theme from that movie and, and brought it into our Advent series. And over the last few weeks, we've talked about joy and we used Elf for that one. Uh, then we talked about renewal and talked about a Christmas carol. Last week was love with the Grinch and today is hope with It's a Wonderful Life. I watched this movie again. I've seen it before, but I've watched it again, and it's worth your time. I mean, it's a, it's a good movie. It's, it's uh, in the 40s, obviously, and you can watch uh, whichever version you want. But um, man, some great, great themes out of that. But we're drawing uh, the theme of hope. And George Bailey, uh, most of you know this story, but just in case you don't, uh, George Bailey is, it's a story of George in Bedford Falls, and he's a little kid, and he has, he's he's full of dreams. He just has uh, dreams for his life. He's going to travel the world, and and, and he's he's just full of energy, right? Well, a series of events uh, lead him to staying in Bedford Falls, and he feels in this stuck place. He just can't get out for whatever reason. And there's many reasons for that, but um, he takes over his dad's uh, building and loan. He has an arch enemy in the in the city who's the richest man in the in the city named Mr. Potter, and uh, he's always against him. And it's just it, on every turn, it just feels like nothing goes the way that he wants it to go. And maybe you relate to that in some of our lives. So it just for some reason we can't catch a break, and George is that way. He just can't catch a break. And um, uh, his uncle, who works with him, lost. Uh, a huge amount of money, $8,000. And back in that day, that was a huge amount of money. It still is. Um, and, and they were going to lose everything. And he is just in despair. George Bailey is in despair. And so finally, he goes to this bridge, tall bridge, where there's a river down below, and he's going to take his life. He's just going to end it. He's worth more dead than alive. And then there's Clarence the angel, who's trying to get his wings. Now, this isn't a biblical movie, okay? So don't send me an email on the theology of angels, okay? I understand they don't have to get their wings. But anyway, Clarence is sitting there in charge of George, and he's trying to get his wings. And so he sees that George getting ready to, to jump over. Clarence jumps in, and, and George, obviously knowing George would probably save him. And so long story short, the angel shows George what life would be like in Bedford Falls and with the people that he loved without his life. And eventually, George begs to come back to reality and come back to, much like a, a, a Christmas carol, um, he, he begs to come back, and, and he comes back home, and the city has rallied around him, and they've, they've recovered the money, or they've raised the money. And so anyway, it ends, it ends well, right? It, that's why it's called It's a Wonderful Life. In other words, the theme uh, for a lot of it is, is just, hey, you, you have more than you know. Enjoy your life. It's a wonderful life. But what I'm, I'm going to draw from this is the theme of hope. 
Now, let me give you a definition of Webster's natural definition, in other words, normal definition of hope. And it says this, to want something to happen or be true and think that it could happen or be true. That's a good definition. Uh, and, and, uh, an example would be, will you be able to come to the party? I hope so. Or I could say, will you, I hope you're able to come to Christmas Eve service. I hope so. That type of thing, right? Easy. Now, let me give you, though, a spiritual definition of hope, because the Bible in our church, obviously in 99, when we were thinking of names for what we would call a church that we would start, uh, hope came to the, to the top of that list, and there's a variety of reasons why, and, and we just believe that no matter where you've been and no matter what you've done, there's always hope when you place your, your faith in Jesus. There's always hope, no matter what has happened in your life, there's always hope. And so when I get to talk about hope, it's, it's one of my favorite things, but the spiritual definition of hope is the belief that no matter what, at the end of the day, we can trust God's plan. That's the hope that we have, and this is just my definition. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They're, they're not plans for disaster or bad, but they're plans for good, for a future and a hope. Now, the context of this was not written to us. It was written to Israel. They were in captivity, and he was just giving them an encouragement to say, hey, listen, I've got a plan. Now, the overarching principle or theme that we can draw from is that God has a plan, and he's had a plan since the very beginning. And in that plan, it includes a future and a hope that no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter how dim or dark or challenging our lives may be, God provides a plan. And because of that plan, we have hope. Now, our faith is tied to hope. Hebrews 11, where it de defines faith, it says this, now faith is being sure of what we hope for. In other words, what has God said, and we hope for that? Well, faith is being sure of that hope and certain of what we do not see. So hope is a spiritual thing. It's not just the, the way in which we use it in everyday language, hey, I hope you have a great day, or I hope you have a great year, but hope is a, there's a spiritual context to this, to our faith. In other words, it is tied to our faith. There, there are three things that remain, faith, maybe you don't know that scripture, faith, <laughs> hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Now, we understand love in the context of love, God, the, the definition of love is God, God is love. But along with love is the word hope, that it's never going to go away. There is always going to be this hope that God has it all together. But we use that such in a common way. We use the word hope in such a common way. For instance, we use it like this. I hope the Cowboys will win the Super Bowl. <laughs> okay, now how many are with me? And I hope that the Cowboys will win the Super Bowl. Now I know some of you are out of God's will and you like some other team, <laughs> like the Patriots or whoever, Steelers, Eagles, whatever. Oh yeah, I said it. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> Come meet me after service. I hope, <laughs> I'm kidding. I hope the Cowboys win the Super Bowl. Now, now listen, when you look at the spiritual side of this, we cannot be sure or certain of this. However much we want it, we don't even know if they're going to get to the Super Bowl. There's no way of knowing that unless it's all rigged and the conspiracy of that, I don't know, who knows. But I hope the Cowboys win the Super Bowl. I think this is a wish, not a hope. When it comes to the, to, to, the, to the definition of really what hope is for us as believers, this is a wish. And I do wish the Cowboys win the Super Bowl. And you mean whatever the team is, that's what you hope for or you wish for. Now, we can also say it like this, I, I hope God is in control. And that's an okay to, way to say this. But I think that faith understands that God is in control and that we have a hope because of that. Does it make sense? So we don't have to wonder if God has it in control. We don't have to dream that God has it in control. God has it in control. And because of that, because of our faith in what he has said in his scripture, in, in his word, we have a hope. There's a future. So when it comes to this, I've, I've got a, a few observations that, that I want to make because hope is an important uh, part of the Advent theme. And, and Advent, if you didn't know this, is, is just a, uh, another word for arrival, Christ's 
Advent, his first coming as a baby, and then Christ's second coming as Advent when he returns to this earth. So we look back on what God has done, and we look forward to what he's going to do. So Advent is, is a helping us, again, I've said it over and over, I think in, in every week, it's a refocus on, on our perspective. It's a refocusing our attention on what really matters in this season, and that's what Advent was designed for. Whether that theme is love or renewal or peace or joy or hope or, you know, whatever it is, it's to refocus our minds who in many ways and in, in, a variety of, in a variety of reasons, we get distracted. So Advent, a lot like Lent in, in leading up to Easter, it helps us refocus. It helps us refocus. So a couple of observations when we think of, and going back to the movie with George Bailey at that bridge, I think that, I, I think that uh, there's a lot of us that have felt that way. And you may not jump over a bridge, or you may not have seriously considered doing something like that, but maybe you have. And, and there's a hopelessness to, you, to your life. It just seems you can't t- catch a break, and it seems like there's no light at the end of the tunnel at all. And so you, you feel this sense of depression and discouragement and hopelessness because of your marriage or because of this or that. And so I have some observations about hope that I hope is that I hope is going to help you. And number one is hope in hopelessness. That the definite and again I, I like definitions, but hopelessness. The definition of this is having a, no expectation of good or success. It's I mean you're just in despair. And many of us know what that's like. Many of us have been in a marriage where there is no hope. Maybe we are in a marriage where there is no hope. Maybe we're in a relationship where there's no hope. Maybe, maybe it's a job thing or a, a health thing or a money thing. And it just seems like maybe because of our bad decisions or sinful things, or, or maybe just life as it feels like it's dealt us a bad hand like George. And, and we just feel like, man, this, I mean, this, this is ridiculous. I, I just can't seem to catch a break. I'm in despair no sense of anything good getting ready to happen. And there's a lot of reasons for this. But the, 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 the Christmas story is directly tied to this sense of hopelessness. So 700 years before Jesus, the, the prophet Isaiah in chapter one, and I, and I brought out this scripture a few weeks ago, but it's that scripture where Isaiah gets a, you know, a, the, the experience of seeing the Lord, and, and it's just, his train fills the temple, and the Lord says, whom shall we send? I've got a message, whom shall we send? And Isaiah just says, yes, here am I, send me. And, and it is just, it, it's an awesome chapter, but the reality of that chapter is it's not good news that, he, that Isaiah has for Israel. Because of their rebellion, because of their sin, because of their complacency, God is going to discipline them. He's going to bring them into captivity, and it's not a good message. Chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 are all negative. They're all like, hey, listen, it's not going to be good. There's there's something getting ready to happen. But in chapter 9, he gives some perspective for the hopeless feeling that they have. And Israel, if you didn't know this, the the story of Israel, I mean, even back from the Egypt days in captivity or slavery for 400 years, then Moses takes them out, Joshua takes them to the promised land, and they have king after king and battle after battle, and then they brought into captivity from the Egyptians, uh, the Assyrians, Medo-Persia, the Babylonians, Greek, Rome, Greece, Rome, they will all rule Israel. And it's because of their disobedience. It's just because they refuse to surrender and fully follow the Lord. They would get distracted, and they would follow other gods, and they would worship other gods. But chapter 9 of Isaiah gives us a glimpse of hope for their hopelessness. Chapter 9, verse 1. Nevertheless, that time of darkness and despair will not go on forever. The land of Zebulun and Nephtali will be humbled. That's the area of Galilee, modern-day Galilee, But there will be a time in the future when Galilee of the Gentiles, which lies along the road that runs between the Jordan and the sea, which is the Mediterranean Sea, so between the Jordan River, which is on the east side of Israel, modern-day Israel, and then the the sea, which is on the west side, 
will be filled with glory. The people who walk in darkness, they will see a great light. So there's hope. There's not, it's not always going to be like this, Israel. There's, it's not always going to be like this, but there's coming a time in which the darkness will be overshadowed by this light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, a light will shine. You will enlarge the nation of Israel. In other words, but not because they have more babies. You will enlarge the nation of Israel with Gentiles who will put their faith in Jesus. We're all here today, most of us. Most of us are Gentiles, in other words, non-Jew, and we are a part of this enlarging of Israel. And its people will rejoice. They will rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. In other words, this is victory. There's the, the, the slavery and the, and, the, and the darkness is going to come to an end. Like warriors dividing the plunder, for you will break the yoke of their slavery and lift the heavy burden from their shoulders, not just physically, but spiritually speaking. Sin will be broken because of what Jesus is going to do. You will break the oppressor's rod, just as you did when you destroyed the army of Midian. The boots of the warrior and the uniforms bloodstained by war will all be burned. They will be fuel for the fire. Listen to this. For a child is born to us. Now, this is where we usually pick it up. This is the, the, one of the major Christmas passages. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. In other words, he's that light. He's the one who's going to break the oppressor's rod. He's the one who's going to rescue us. For unto us, or for a child is born to us, a son is given to us, the government, the kingdom of God, the rule of God will rest on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His government and its peace will never end. He will rule with fairness and justice from the throne of ancestor David for all eternity. The passionate commitment of the, whole, of the Lord's army, heaven's army, of the Lord of heaven's armies will make this happen. So in other words, there, there is a time of darkness and there is this, this hopeless feeling that they had. And it's just like, is this ever going to end? There's Moses promised a Messiah. Even when Adam and Eve sinned, the Lord said, I'm going to send someone who's going to bruise his uh, head. And, and it, so, so when is this all happening? It just, and this is hundreds of years. This is 700 years before Jesus. How many know God's timetable is not always our timetable? You ever feel like he is always late? Like, like always. He's, he's never early. He's never like, hey, I'm just here ahead of time just in case something happens. No, it's always like, Wait, where have you been? Well, listen, let, let, me, let me help you to understand. So I'm not making light of any of our um, present challenges that, that cause us to have a feeling or a sense of hopelessness. So I'm not making light of it because those are realities. And we'll stick our hand, head in the sand and we don't pretend they're not there because many of us, there is this um, despairing kind of hopeless, like wandering through life, like what am I doing and why am I here? What is, I, I can't catch a break. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. See, those are real things. And, and the Lord never promised that if you come to him, he's going to make you rich. Or if you come to him, he's going to make you successful. If you come to him, he's going to... No, no. He actually promised the opposite in the sense that it's not going to always be easy. And there's going to be things that you don't understand. And there's going to be things that you pray for that you think are right, but they're not. I'm not going to do that. And it's frustrating, to say the least... And, it, and it, there's this sense of, maybe you're still following the Lord, but there's this sense of, man, I, I just can't make sense of this. I, I don't know why he's allowing this or, you know, whatever the, the statement might be. Let me help you uh, help in our hopelessness and in, in our sense of challenge and our emotional uh, grief or, or uh, grieving of, of a tragedy. And those things are real and that we're human. We're going to go through those things. Let me help us have a look at hope in a different way. The key to hope is zooming out. Many of, our familiar, many of us are familiar with that, that phrase, zooming out. You, you, you can zoom out a, a, on a picture. You can zoom out on Google Earth, and you can see the bigger picture. To, the key to hope, then, is, spiritually speaking, is zooming out from our circumstances to see the bigger picture. We just take one step at a time toward the center of God's will for our lives because we know there's a bigger picture, because we know the promises of God in that he has a future for us. He has a plan for us. He is not caught off guard with your present challenge or my present challenge. He is not caught off guard with our emotional grief. He's not caught off guard with what we're going through. We don't have a God who's not touched, who doesn't understand what we go through. Hebrews tells us that. 
So hope then is the ability to not just see what we're walking through, not just hear what we're hearing, but it's, it's the ability to zoom out from our present trouble or crisis or whatever it is, challenge, and we can see the bigger picture and understand God's Word says that at the end of the day, now listen, the disciples, remember when they followed Jesus in three years and then He died and then He rose from the dead and they're like, whoa, what in the world is this? This is crazy. And then He says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to empower you. And, and he, they preached the gospel in Jerusalem and they went through Antioch and then in modern day Turkey and modern day Greece, modern day Rome, Spain, India. All these disciples went their own way and they preached preached the gospel, established the kingdom of God, but all of them died because of their faith, were executed. Now, how many know when you, when you think of your problems right now and you think of that, you're thinking, okay, well, maybe I don't have it so bad. But the reality is that when we follow the Lord, I think we have to understand this, that it's not always going to go the way that we want it, but because of who we are and because of who He is, we have a hope that is larger, bigger picture than what it is that we're going through. And because of that, we just take one step at a time toward the center, back to the center. I've gotten distracted. I've been, I've been uh, feeling dis- depressed and discouraged. And l- listen, for the last two years, we've gone through and walked through a huge challenge in all of our lives, whether that be with, with COVID or with the economy or with political things or with health things or with racial things. Man, it's been a challenge, un- probably unlike any of us have ever lived through. But as the people of God, of all the people on the planet who should zoom out and have like, okay, God's got this in control. Doesn't mean there are things not to concern ourselves with or pray about, but I'm going to zoom out and I'm going to see the bigger picture. That's hope and hopelessness. And I think it's important. All things, Romans 8, 20, let me just put it on there. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. Now this may not, listen, this may not always look like what you and I want. It may not always go the way in which we think it should go. But again, this comes back to a hope that we have in who God is and he has a plan. So everything's going to work together. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know what that means. I can't figure, I've tried to figure it out. I want to figure it out. In fact, I've helped him figure this out. But at the end of the day, I can zoom out and I can put my trust in him. And I'm just going to walk from my distraction or from my depression or from my challenge. I'm just going to keep walking. I'm going to keep walking toward the center of his will for my life. Now, the second observation about hope is hope in perspective, tied really, really close to hope and hopelessness, but hope in perspective. Now, in chapter 9 that we just read in Isaiah, there is this, hey, darkness won't last forever. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will rest, the kingdom of God, everything that God has to offer will rest on his shoulders, and he's going to bring peace. And and there's a hope that's tied to this. We can trust in God's plan that hopelessness is not unending. Despair is not unending. However, in chapter 8, if you go one chapter before, there is, there is an incredible uh, group of scriptures that Isaiah gets from the Lord that is unbelievably timely for us today. Chapter 9 is that, that famous Christmas verse, unto us a child is born. You go to chapter 8, though, and it's an amazing group of verses that are going to help us put in perspective the hope that we really have. Verse 11, chapter 8. The Lord has given me a strong warning not to think like everyone else does. Let me, see, let me read that again. The Lord has given me a strong warning not to think like everyone else else does. Now in chapter 9, he's going to say, hey, darkness is not going to be here forever, so, so don't despair. There's, going to, there's coming a rescue. And he warns him before he says this. He's now like, listen, don't think like everyone else does. He said, don't call everything a conspiracy. I didn't write this. <laughs> you know I love you, right? How many know that? No, I love you. 
Let me, let me just, can I help? Let me encourage you, maybe even go as strong to say, I feel compelled to say, that some of us need to spend less time digging on the internet and more time digging in his word. Even if the conspiracies are true, whatever they are, the Lord says, now I understand the context of this. I understand it's Isaiah he's saying, hey, it's a hopeless situation. You're in captivity, but don't think like everyone else thinks. And don't call everything a conspiracy. In other words, your perspective is in the wrong place. Like they do. And don't live in dread of what they fear. Well, it frightens them. I want you to think about the last two years. And I want you to think about the people of God who have, I mean, some of us, not all of us, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm actually speaking to other churches who watch online, not this church, because I know we don't do this. But there are, how many, don't raise your hands, but how many know somebody in the Christian world who has feared what is feared the world? How many know somebody who is calling everything a conspiracy? How many know somebody who is thinking like everyone else does? No wonder, no wonder the world looks at the church and it goes, okay, they're kooky. They're weird. You listen to, we're listening to false prophets who give all kinds of crazy prophets that didn't come true, yet we still watch them. We still listen. I'm telling you, I'm going to get upset here in a minute, so you better calm me down. But I'm just telling you, <laughs> stop listening to those, those people. Go to his word, guys. Don't look, and look, don't look at a man. Go to his word. Okay, okay. So uh, uh, let me, uh, you can send me an email. That's fine. I'll, <laughs> I'll help you. Yeah, in fact, you can meet me in the lobby. Again, I'll, I'll help you. <laughs> so make the Lord of heaven's armies holy. So in other words, hey, don't think like everybody else thinks. Don't call everything a conspiracy. Don't be fearful of whatever everybody else is fearful of. Make the Lord holy in your life. Lord, 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 we have a hope, and we have somebody who knows what's going on. He has the bigger picture in sight. Make the Lord holy in your life, and then he is the one you should fear. He's the one who should make you tremble. He will keep you safe. But to Israel and Judah, speaking of Jesus, he will be a stone that makes people stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many will stumble and fall, never to rise again. They will be snared and captured. In other words, they're not going to believe in him. You know this. John 1 tells us he came to his own people and his own people rejected him. Preserve the teaching of God and trust his instructions to those who will follow me. I will wait for the Lord who has turned away from, his, from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my hope in him. Next verse, and I, the children the Lord has given me, serve as signs and warnings to Israel from the Lord of heaven's armies who dwells in his temple on Mount Zion. Someone may say to you, let's ask the media, and, oh, I'm sorry, the mediums. <laughs> that was just a slip. Let's ask the mediums and, and those who consult the spirits of the dead with their whispering and mutterings, they will tell us what to do. But shouldn't people ask God for guidance? You understand? Now, I'm not trying to take verses out of context here. All I'm saying is, as, as, as the Lord prepares Israel for this thing, and, but there's a rescue coming, but, and because of that hope that a rescue's coming, hey, don't think like everybody else thinks. Don't, don't spend your, waste your time on myths and conspiracies. Don't fear like the world fears. I will put my hope in the Lord. And we're going to ask the Lord for guidance. Should the living seek guidance from those who are dead, either physically or spiritually? Should the church look to the media for guidance or for anybody that's spiritually dead and, and go, well, well, I believe what they say. Can we just put our trust in the Lord? Can we just call it good and live our lives for him and make the Lord holy in our lives and trust him and zoom out of, of the current crisis, zoom out of what you are individually going, or we are individually going through, or we as a nation, or we as a world, can we not trust him? Can we not just ask him for guidance? Man, this is 101 Christianity, but I think we have to be reminded, right? And Advent does that. It helps refocus us. Look to God's instructions and teachings. 
People who contradict, contradict his word are completely in the dark. And they really are. They're just going from place to place, one another, weary and hungry. And because they're hungry and they will rage and curse their king and their God because they're not finding the answers, they will look up to heaven and down to the earth. But wherever they look, there will be trouble and anguish and dark despair. They will be thrown into the darkness. Now, this is the end of chapter 8. Chapter 9, verse 1 says, Nevertheless, the darkness will not last forever. Okay, so my point here is, guys, this is so important. Hope with the wrong perspective will always lead us to disappointment. When we place our hope in a man, when we place our hope in a president, when we place our hope in a king, when we place our hope in a government, when we place our hope in money, when we place our hope in anything else that this world has to offer, we will find ourselves thinking like everybody else thinks, chasing myths and conspiracies, fearing what everybody else fears. And I'm just telling you, this Advent season, guys, our only hope and help will come from Him. Whether we live or die, it doesn't matter. Hope gives us the bigger picture that God has a plan. And if we live, we live to be a light. So of all the people on the planet who should walk in peace, who should walk in grace, who should walk in hope, who should walk in joy, no matter what the circumstance, I'm not discounting that it's, that it's hard right now. I'm not discounting that your life may feel um, hopeless. I'm not discounting that. I'm just, I'm just trying to encourage us to zoom out just a bit because the overarching plan and theme of God is that he wins in the end. And I don't mean that in, in some political statement. I just mean that we win in the end, that God has a plan and he's going to restore all things. And there are three things that remain, faith, hope, and love, the greatest of these but there's a hope and there's always a hope. So no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter what's happened in your life, there's always hope. We trust the Lord. We don't trust anybody else. We trust the Lord. You don't trust me. I'm not the hope of the world. This church is not the hope of the world. Jesus is the hope of the world. And as believers, let us be reminded this Advent season to not be distracted Money, success, chasing, digging, fearing. Listen, you may be hopeless today, and that's why Jesus said, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. He's not making fun of us. He's not saying, hey, come on, you should have hope because you're a Christian. No, he's not saying, he's just saying, yeah, you should have hope, but there are times in which we feel lost, times in which we feel in despair, And in those times, just know that we have a hope. And it's in those times that we run to him, not away from him. So in this time in your life, wherever you might find yourself, in a hard place, in a challenging place, or maybe it's a good place, maybe you've been distracted by political things or or the world things, and those things are important. I'm not saying they're not important. I'm not saying that there are not things to work out and pray over. Not saying they're not things that God may call you to do to get involved and to run for an office or whatever. I'm not saying those things aren't important. I'm just saying zoom out just a bit. And don't get consumed with these things because we are citizens of heaven. We're not citizens of this world. Does this make sense to you? So let me put it on the screen again like this. The key to hope is zooming out from our circumstances to see the bigger picture. Take one step at a time toward the center of God's will for our lives And then let's finally add the last part, trusting that he is in control. Our faith is tied to the hope that we have in him. And the advent of Jesus is the hope of the world. If you're hopeless, he's here. If you're hopeless, he says, come to me. If you're hoping in someone or something else and you're distracted, don't waste your time. He is our hope. Lean in. Draw near to him, he will draw near to you. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Don't be distracted by what's going on in our world. Don't be, zoom out, zoom out, your life or the world, zoom out, and let's walk in hope like the people of God that we are. 
God, your word, again, sometimes it just hits us right between the eyes and it, it, it divides what we want and what you want. Not to distract us from anything. So if anything I've said has distracted from, from the real message of hope, God, help us have ears to hear. But the, the bottom line for us in this Advent season as we remember your birth and as we thank God for the plan of salvation and, and the sinless life that you would live and, and the, the things that you would walk through so that you could relate to us. You're not a God who is not touched with our emotions. You're not touched with our challenges. You've walked through rejection. You've walked through temptation. You've walked through pain. You've walked through hurt. You've walked through reje- uh, d- disloyalty. You've walked through it all. And yet, you did it without sin, and you became the lamb who would take away the sins of the world, and especially in our lives. And so, Lord, we put our trust in that. There's a hope that we have. So let us not get distracted. Let us not lose hope, even in our present circumstances, because you are in control, and we have a faith that is tied to that hope. So let your kingdom come. Let your will be done here in our lives, on this earth, as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.